and that the and the other part is when these kids are told by everyone around them, well, it's just high school. It's like, come on, man. It's not just high school. It is their life. And rowing takes so much commitment to just participate in it. You know, it takes so much. The interest, here's the best thing about youth nationals and Justin, I actually, I promise I'm done. Our cohort of teammates ahead of us, right? So the Olympic generation before us, like the 90, you know, the 88, 92, 96, 2000 era, their kids are all in high school now. And whether it was they were talking to a peer or not, but those parents were all just so happy to be there. So you're talking about the most badass rowers to walk the planet are there. And it's like, yeah, I'm here because my kid's rowing. <laughs> my kid's rowing, right? I was like, yeah, what do you like? What do you, I don't know. They're just rowing. I'm just happy they're rowing. They love it. It's great. I, I love, it. love it. I get to watch my kid row. We talk about rowing all the time. What are you doing for college? Whatever. Like the questions was always like, whatever. Oh, or they're going to so-and-so. Really? That's awesome. Yeah, that's where they wanted to go. You know? Y'all like the best rowers in the world, the most competitive people in the world. Some of them are a couple, right? Both parents are an Olympian. And they're all just so happy that their kids, they have this common bond with their kids. Nothing mm -hmm. else matters about where it goes. And to me, that was the juxtaposition. Is that you would think our cohort would be like, okay, and then like, you know, kind of King Richard style, you know, of like Will Smith's character from like, no, they're just like, again, their parents are Olympians, which means genetically, like nature of nurtures, the chances of them being competitive are pretty high. <laughs> them having some genetic talent, pretty high. And that they're just so happy. And that, that's like the example to remember is like, if the best rowers in the world are just happy to be here, that is the ultimate role of the parent. You're not there to you're, you're not there to manipulate, calculate, like make a strategic plan. Just be happy that your kid's giving you this amazing experience, and then watch what they're capable of. Yeah, I think that I think that's really interesting because you know, consciously or subconsciously, those parents are likely supporting their child in the way they know they wanted to be best supported or were best supported in their pursuit of what it is that they did. And, you know, it's, it is, it is a really interesting thing because what I remember about, you know, the way that, that I was raised, which, which I, I look back on now and I just love it there were like strict things. You weren't allowed to be lazy. You weren't allowed not to focus on your studies. You weren't allowed not to perform there. You weren't allowed not to do a sport or not be involved with music or not do this, but you had the autonomy to choose what it is that you wanted to do. And whatever it is you chose, my parents, Ed and Noreen, man, they supported us unendingly and not in the way where they played some role or orchestrated anything in the process they were there to support and fan the flames and build the excitement and keep us really you know excited about what we were doing and 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 we're just supportive just there right always there always supporting and in in many you know pivotal different situations and you know one of those i think was when I was an age group swimmer. So I was a swimmer before I switched to rowing and I didn't switch to rowing until junior year. And I was a good student, but I wasn't an amazing student. And so there was going to need, I needed something right to, to secure admission to a good college. It just, you know, that I needed a differentiating factor and I found rowing. I started to fall in love with rowing. I told my parents, I think I want to row. I don't think I want to swim anymore. And my parents sat me down and we had a very serious conversation about that. Well, if you stick with swimming, this is the path that you're on. And here are the likelihood of, you know, what can happen in the next few years based on sort of your trajectory. You can forego that and you can enter a sport that you have no experience in. And we don't know what's going to happen there. What do you want to do? It's like, oh, okay. Well, you put it that way. And then you have a lot of thought about it. And I was like, no, nah, but I love rowing. So I decided, no, I, I want to row. And they said, okay, then you better get real serious about it. You know, this, you, you better, you, you commit to it the way that you committed to, to swimming in the back of my mind. I'm like, don't worry about that, you know, but 
from the parent perspective, it was sort of like, Hey, if you're going to forego the swimming thing that you've been doing since you're 10 years old and you're already performing well in the, you know, CIF sectionals and, and you're already making the finals as a, as a sophomore, you know, you sure that's what you want to give up. And, you know, that was it. They trusted that I, that I was making the decision for me for the right reasons and then supported me in that process. It was not, no, you're not going to row. We need you to swim because that's going to do X, Y, and Z or, okay, now you're in rowing and we need to get really heavy handed about it to make sure that it goes right. Right. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's very interesting to me because just because I wasn't raised in that environment. When I see Dan, what you're talking about, where you get the sense that it's like, okay, this kid's good and this kid's good at rowing, but they're not leading this thing. They're not in charge of it. They're very good. And I've seen some really, really good high school athletes where I'm like, man, if you love this thing, like at 10%, I would be amazed where you would go from here. But you just feel like they're just, yeah, it's what I do. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's great. You know, and you're sort of like, you're not, you, you don't love it. You're not there. And, and that's where you realize that, you know, other, other people, other forces are driving the process and, and that's tough. And so I feel like it's tough then for you guys as well, because you have to be able to identify that. And maybe it is easy for you guys to identify, but sometimes it takes me a while. I'll be working with an athlete for a few months and I'm like, oh, it's not really adding up. You know, they put on a good show for a while, but then eventually the curtain kind of comes back. So, you know, like th I often talk to my athletes about this, that, you know, when it comes to recruiting, you're not, you're not going to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. Like, the, like a good coach who can recruit well does just that. And they, okay. they can, they can separate those from, you know, separate those who are truly passionate about it and are going to make a mark over the four years that they're going to be there. And those that are just kind of like, yeah, I'm good at this and it's something to do. And I, I'm talking to you because I'm supposed to. And that kind of talks to what you were speaking about, Dan, where it's your, you know, at, at your time, you know, recruiting with Northeastern, if an athlete comes to you and they know nothing about NU, you're like, why are, what are we talking about? Like, what, what are we doing here? You know, like yeah, it, it's, it's, um, you look, you get it. You come to, you come to Boston and you're like, well, there's a billion tools here. So let's go try and get as many in or you're going to decent. Like it's, it's part of it. And I think the nice thing about it though, and I think this is where recruiting to talk about it, having being worth the endeavor, even if you don't get one of those coveted spots and where sports is beautiful is well, you do get some information, data points during the college process earlier than most. And if you have busted your ass for four years in high school rowing and sure, maybe your passion's waning, but you're also like, you don't want to totally have a sunk cost in it, both the parents or the athlete. And it is part of the discovery process. I think that like if you go through the recruiting process and you're not like ready, like if you're not chomping at the bit to row in college, it's a good sign. You should probably hang it up. Yeah. So and just yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Dan. I was going to say, but, but if you leverage your assets to get that spot again, to me, it then becomes part of if a kid takes a spot and quits I still think that goes on to the college coaches to say, okay, again, data point, what are we doing wrong that we're having the attrition? Right. So I don't think it's just the high school coaches and the high school parents. I think the collegiate coaches, like if we're going to talk about, again, how are we helping young people not have a mental health crisis because of recruiting? That's what I'm here for, right? Is because a driven kid like any of us, truthfully, they're going to do it. Like if your kids got the stuff, they're going to do it. They're going to drive the press. They're going to drive you nuts with the process. Like I'm sure all of you drove your parents nuts. Right? Like they were psyched, but they were like, okay. Like I was like, okay, dad, we got to go to Boston. I need to ride. Am I taking the train? Where do I get the money for the train? Do I have to work? For like, how do I get there? They want to take me on an official visit. And God bless my dad, man. Dude was like, let's roll. We're driving everywhere. He was so excited to be part, like for him, again, 
He's just so, he's like, yes, let's go look at colleges. I don't care where you go. And then I actually turned down a full scholarship to go to Northeastern. And he almost killed me because we were so poor. <laughs> and they didn't offer me anything in my freshman year. And uh, it t- they took a huge risk. Like my parents took a huge flyer on me for that process. Like talk about driving the process. Like I'm going, can you help me out? They remortgaged the house to be able to help me out. And they were like, we can only help you a little bit. So luckily it had decent financial aid. And I just had to earn, I just had to earn that scholarship and go to buzz. I was like, I can't afford this any other way. It's row- like rowing is going to pay these bills. And buzz came through and between the financial aid and the scholarship, it paid for my tuition. And I just had to take out loans for living in Boston, you know? And it's like, so for me as a recruiter, right. And as a high school coach, when a kid's like, I don't know if I want to do another 2K. I'm like, dude, I had to convince my parents to mortgage their house, bro. Like, what do you want from me? You know, so I think it I think it comes down, I think it comes down to perspective too. Like you, everybody's got to know their audience a little bit. Um, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is I invented this question for myself because it helped me clarify the recruiting process, which is so are you looking to go to college to row at a higher level? Or are you looking to use rowing to get you into college? And I think that that question, just because it was a subconscious thing they had to decide, they usually answered. And if they said, I'm using rowing to get into college, it didn't mean it was a done conversation. Because again, it's on me as the collegiate coach to find talent, develop talent, bring talent in, and and believe that I'm such a good coach and I have such a good training program that I will help that athlete find those 20 plus seconds. And if they're really lucky, they'll, they'll be a 30 plus seconds. So I, again, the onus is on me, but I also remember just saying like, look, you should really roll in college. And even if Northeastern is not the right place to be. And I hope that I see you one day across the line and you do whatever it takes to beat me here at Northeastern. Like I wanted to make sure is that whatever decision they made as a young person in rowing, that they can, they should continue to pursue. And I think that's what's missing is we create this emo- this false emotional terminus without giving the person, the young person, wait, this is their life. And regardless, at some point, every athlete has an identity crisis when it's over. And I think that's what your parents did well was about the swimming one because there had to be a little bit of an identity crisis when you decided to leave this common place. Like I know for me, when I tore my shoulder and wrestling was over, the fact that I wasn't going to be a collegiate wrestler, like I – that was my first real like rock hard. Do I have the stuff to keep doing sports? Cause this hurts. Mm-hmm. This hurts. Like I'm, this is over. This is, and I was again, high school depressed. Didn't know what to do. Ended on an injury. Didn't have the swan song. Like that emotional death of part of me for wrestling was no different than when I wrote on my, my wrote my last stroke at pursuing the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Except I had zero perspective. <laughs> when the Olympics was over, I was 33 getting married. At 18, it was my life. Sure. My life. You know, and that's what that's the other part we have to remember that these are these are our young people and this is their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if this is the end of the road, that's gonna be really hard for them. So there is a gravity to the recruiting process that I don't think we acknowledge. No, that, co- that coaches, does make sense. Everyone's optimistic. It, they're they're falsely optimistic. Sure. Like, right? It's going to be great because you're going to get out of college. You're going to get a scholarship. You're going to get a likely letter. You're going to get whatever. It's going to be great. What if it's not? Right. And But to your point, you know, I I I do believe as well that if you want to row in college – you can, yeah. but that may come in the form of D3 or club, or it may come in the form of a less competitive team than maybe you had featured yourself being on. But at the same time, if you truly want to row at a higher level, at a D1 level and actually be recruited, well, that goes beyond just wanting to row in college. I mean, that comes with a huge commitment that comes with, with huge determination, dedication, desire to make it happen. So, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, 
that's kind of the gut check, right? The gut check is, you know, are you willing to work as hard as you need to, to put yourself in a position to be a D1 athlete? Um, are you willing to work hard enough to learn if you have what it takes to be a D1 athlete, right? Some people don't even want to discover that necessarily. And so, you know, I think that's part of the process as well, because it's just, for me, you know, as I look back being younger, like it was never, there was never any, I, I didn't have to answer that question. That was not a question for me. That was already decided. Like the, right. the moment I, I started taking strokes, I was like, where can I go with this? Like yeah, how so far we can all I had go? That. We all right. had that, right? We all had that. So I think that's, those athletes aren't the issue. 